And I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint. Um, okay, it looks like from my setup, it looks like you can see the PowerPoint as well. Right. Okay, good. You can and go down and do the full Yeah, slideshow. do the slideshow. Yep. What is this all about? It's lifelong learners. There was a thing yesterday that Marilyn told me about about okay. religion in Appalachia. About religion uh -huh. in Appalachia. And I okay. tuned into the last part of it. And it was pretty interesting. And somebody I might got it. need I got it. to okay, you've got it. All right. All right. Um, so um today we're talking about race. And if you were with Lifelong Learners, the in-person version that used to meet at the Senior Center, um, the first session, I was gonna do this sequence for the in-person before COVID hit. And I managed to do the first presentation and then the world shut down. And so this is gonna be the long awaited uh, resumption of that session. The first one is very similar to what I did in person, but I have added some new slides and some new ideas. And so it, it may look familiar, and that could be because you attended that session. But I'm going to be talking in three segments. The first segment, I'm going to do my best to get you caught up with what anthropologists and human geneticists say about race in the human species. And what they say is that there are no races in the human species, that there's one human race. Um, if you look at us genetically, now that we've done the full Linda, I accidentally muted you, if you'll unmute yourself. Okay, can I'm you, hear, can you hear me now? Okay, how long was I muted? What did people hear? About a minute. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, this is gonna be three segments to cover um, the idea of race. Uh, the idea of, the first one is gonna be why the scientists say there are, is no such thing as race that it's a human social construction used only in certain cultures. The next session is going to be on how, how the American racial system came about historically and understand that it makes a whole lot more sense if we compare it to a really, really totally different racial system that they have in Japan and also compare it with the similar and yet quite different. Everything about the origin of race in Brazil was similar to the United States, except for one factor that bumped race in Brazil into something virtually unrecognizable. Um, for instance, Brazilians cannot figure out why Americans think we've had a black president. They look at Barack Obama and go, he looks pretty pale to us. He can't possibly be a black man. <laughs> Whereas in our system, he's a black man. So the second session is going to compare how three different systems of race historically came about. Like if scientifically it doesn't exist, you know, we're not looking at a squirrel and calling it a squirrel. So why have we made up squirrels? You know, races like a vampire or a dragon, scientists can't find it when they go looking for it. And so we're gonna try and figure out why did we develop that? And then this third session is going to go into the more recent historical development of how we came to be where we are now with race in the United States. Uh, I'm gonna do a lot of focusing on the 20th century to see how we wind up in the 21st. 
with the idea of race and race relations and race problems that we have in this country. So today we're gonna to be talking about race and I'm gonna try and show you with pictures from all over the world that our idea of four races, black, white, red, and yellow, roughly corresponding with the continent of Africa, the continent of Europe, the continent of Asia and Native Americans, why that just doesn't work. So it's been scientifically disproven to exist in nature. And as I'm gonna show you in the comparative, the middle session, it's constructed differently in different cultures, which should be another thing that will clue us into, hey, if this thing was real, how come it's so totally different in Japan? and pretty different in Brazil. So today we're gonna to talk about science. So scientists didn't set out to prove that there was no such thing as race. Scientists set out to clarify it, to make it more scientific. They said, we've got this kind of broad idea that's evolved over time and let's make it precise. Let's figure out what race every human being on the planet belongs to. Let's figure out how many races there are. And let's figure out for absolute certain how to tell which race to put somebody in. And in order to do that, we have to know exactly what are the criteria for that race. Are they tall? Are they short? Are they pale? Are they dark? Do they have curly hair, straight hair? Do they have blood type O or blood type AB? How do we recognize what characteristics tell us what race to put people in and how many races are there? And the reason why they thought they needed to do that because there were a lot of things that didn't fit into the system. For instance, um, the United States, we have uh, the category, um, Pacific Islander. What do we do with Pacific Islanders? What, you know, are they part of the Asian race? Are they part of the African race? Are the Northern Pacific Islanders who have brown, light brown skin, are they a different race from the Southern Pacific Islanders who have very dark brown skin? What do we do with Pacific Islanders? Another question was, um, North American Indians, are they the same race as South American Indians? Maybe we've got two races there. And then let's look at Europe. In the South, you have people with what we define as an olive complexion. They almost always have black curly hair and they almost always have brown eyes. Are they really the same race? as those blonde haired, blue eyed Germans in the north of Europe. Maybe there's more than one race in Europe. So scientists didn't set out to prove there's no such thing as race. They set out to figure out how many races are there, what characteristics go with each one, and then let's put everybody in the world into a race. Once they started trying to do that systematically, that's when they wound up proving to themselves that race doesn't exist. Okay, why is it not letting me go on to the next slide? Um, oh, and I need Cheryl because she's my troubleshooter. <laughs> I am screen sharing. Um, and I'll get Carol. I got it. I got it. Okay, so here's a map of the world. People definitely come from different places, all the corners of the globe, even though the globe doesn't have any real corners, we call it that. And that should begin to clue you in that when we think about race, we get really irrational. For example, we talk about the European race, they come from over here. And then we talk about the Asian race, they come from over here. What do we do with the people who come from here? Uh, you know, this is a separate continent. 
this is a pretty much separate continent, except for kind of being connected to all of that through this. This is pretty much a separate continent. I mean, Isthmus of Panama ain't much, let's call it a separate continent. But when we look at Europe and Asia, wow, it's one big glob of dirt. Where's the boundary? And so when we look at the reality here already, it might make us go, huh, why are the people over here different from the people over here when the people over here aren't supposed to be a different race from the people on their opposite coast? No other continent has different races on opposite coasts. Why would this? And so that was created by specific historic processes Turns out that the official geographic separation between Europe, oops, and Asia, go back, um, is the Ural Mountains. And the Ural Mountains have very broad mountain passes, open prairie where you can literally walk through and barely see the mountain range on either side. It's so flat. It also turns out that the people on either side of the Ural Mountains, if we were really different dealing with races divided by a mountain range here, the people on this side would immediately look different from the people on this side, but it turns out they don't. They look a lot of like, they tend to have uh, olive complexions, uh, rosier than some of the other olive complected people in the world. They have black hair in the south and sometimes red hair in the north. Red hair? Yep, red hair. And um, not only do they look exactly alike on either side of the Ural Mountains, this alleged boundary between continents, but they also have the same culture. There has never been a political boundary there in the middle of the Ural Mountains. It's all part of Russia. It's all part of multiple Siberian cultures. It's all start part of steppe herding culture. And culturally the same, people have relatives on the other side of the mountain range. There's no way they're different from one another. They're more alike than just about any patch of ground you can find on the planet. Yet, if we're going to take the boundary between races to be continents, well, already we've got a problem. What do we do with Europe and Asia? Now, the scientists notice that it's real obvious that people who live over here look really different from the people who live over here. And furthermore, the people who live up here look even more different from the people who live down here. Uh, you've got black hair here, you've got black hair here, but you've got blonde hair here. Well, maybe we've got a racial divide around here somewhere. And don't forget our patch of redheads over here and our other patch of redheads over there. As soon as we started looking for geography, we figured out that the geography wasn't making a whole lot of sense. For example, in Northern India, the people look a lot like the people over here. Northern Indians look a lot like Middle Easterners. Southern Indians, however, have dark brown skin like the people over here and the people over here. So let's look at some of the pictures of what people, what real variation in the world looks like. Because of course we don't all look the same, but when we look for the patterns to the variation, that's when we start seeing that black, white, red, and yellow just doesn't work. So we can refer to the idea of trait frequencies. How often do people have black hair in any given population? How often do they have blue eyes? What percentage of them have hazel eyes? What percentage are blonde? What percentage are over seven feet tall? What percentage are under five feet tall? 
And so it's when we look at those trait frequencies that we start figuring this out that race just doesn't work the way we think it's supposed to. So I've got a picture here and it's a group of boys and you can see they all have similar traits. They all have brown skin. They all have black hair. The black hair in all cases is straight. If you look at their lips, kind of mid-range, not thick, not thin. If you look at their cheekbones, if you look at the shape of their ears, if you look at how broad their noses are, these boys look a lot alike one another. Now, they are from Southern India. They are the Dravidian people of India. And they look an awful lot like the people of Southern Southeast Asia. So are they Asian? Do we lump them in with our stereotype of a person from Japan? You'll also find a lot of straight black hair in Japan, but the face shape, is that Japanese? No. The skin tone, does that match the Japanese? No. I want you to just look at this one single picture and start questioning the validity of the concept of an Asian race. And that's what the scientists did. They looked around the world and said, it doesn't work the way we thought it was supposed to. It doesn't work the way we were raised to believe. These kids who are clearly Asian don't look like our stereotype of Asian. So, um, our culture's notions of race, when we look at them systematically and try and figure out what does an Asian person look like, for example, turns out it's pretty irrational. Uh, for example, and this is one of my favorite silly things about race, it's hard to find silly, fun things about Adolf Hitler, but this is one of them, at least I find it silly. Um, the leader of the master race, the master race was supposed to be blonde haired, blue eyed Germans. The leader of the master race was a brown haired, hazel eyed Austrian. And in photos, they were really big on color photography. They were really big on, you know, fun cultural stuff in Germany, like the Volkswagen. They invented the stereo and they were really big on colorizing photographs. And they always colorized their Führer's picture to make his eyes look very bright blue. They weren't. They were as far off from blonde haired, blue eyed German as was his actual ancestry and his hair color, they were hazel. Oh, well, race is pretty irrational. Uh, Americans believe, we think we assign race based on appearance, mainly skin tone. We talk about people of color. We talk about white people. We talk about black people. It's a little offensive these days, but we talk about the red man. We have historically spoken about the yellow peril when we're afraid of Asian people, even though we just saw a bunch of pictures of Asians who don't have yellow skin at all. In fact, nobody on the planet really has yellow skin. Um, but here we've got a man with pretty light colored skin and yet our culture recognizes him as black. And that's Colin Powell and I, I can't find it. I actually had a Time Magazine cover where he's posing in the photo right next to the younger George Bush, George W. Bush. And George W. must have been out in the Texas sun. George W.'s skin is a little bit darker than Colin Powell. So why is it a white man could actually have darker skin than a black man 
if we're really basing our assignment of race in America on skin tone, more to question, more to think about. So I'm gonna go through and I'm just gonna show a bunch of pictures from people around the world. Here are two presidents and you might recognize Barack Obama. And if you look carefully, you might see that he's got, well, he's smiling a little more broadly than the other fellow, but there is an ever so slight almond slant uh, Asian stereotype to, to our President Obama's eyes, which might make you think, well, maybe he's Asian. Um, his skin tone, of course, is mid-range. The fellow he's posing with, his skin tone is just a little bit lighter. Unfortunately, he's gone gray already, so we can't see what his original hair color would have been. But his eyes might have a little bit of that, maybe a little less than Barack's. Um, when you try and figure out, well, this is probably another mixed race American, part African, maybe. No, he's the president of American Samoa. And remember I said one of the first clues that the racial system just doesn't work is what do we do with Asia Pacific Islanders? And here's a Pacific Islander. Race, if you've only got four of them, black, white, red, and yellow, where would you put him? United States custom has long been to love Pacific Islanders with Asians. So he would be maybe in the same box as those Southern Indian, very dark skinned group of boys we were looking at earlier. Now, this is what those boys look like when they grow up. This is another South Asian from Southern India, one of the Dravidian populations of India. And you can see their hair tends to get wavier uh, as they mature. Uh, again, uh, pretty dark on the skin tone. He's out in the sun. You can kind of tell from the reflections off of him. Um, his shirt color is actually a little bit reflected in his shiny face. Mid-range broadness on the nose. His eyes are pretty round. They don't have that Asian stereotypical characteristic, but he's a South Indian as well. Now, here's some more of the really dark skin, very round faces, very broad noses. And people might think, well, South Indians who the one girl got her hair colored and the other one is a little lighter. No. No, these are Australian Aborigines. And we often think that the traits that come together in the populations we see the most of in the United States, we often think, oh, dark brown skin always goes with black hair. Not if you're in Australia. Uh, there are three spots in the world where red hair is natural. We've got Ireland, we've got a crescent through Russia that extends down into Hungary. And then we've got Australian Aborigines who naturally, just like Europeans, can naturally have every hair color on the planet. You know, how can you tell a European? Well, look at their hair. You've got so much variety, you don't know what to do with it. The same is true of Australian Aborigines natural light brown hair, dark brown hair, black hair, red hair, blonde hair. And of course, when they age, they get gray and white. Um, I'm gonna skip this one because the tone on the photo is so green. Um, I'll give it away, he's a Palestinian, but the photo tone, I need to get rid of that slide. Okay, here we are. Oh, high cheekbones, broad nose, fairly wide lips, medium skin tone. Um, we can guess Asian, but we'd be wrong. 
Uh, we've got another Samoan here. And this particular individual, he's Japanese, but we even have a lot of variation within Japan. Get curly haired Japanese on the Northern Island. So he's probably from the Northern Island, either that or he's had a perm. Now this little girl, if you look, um, you go back and compare, look at her eye shape and his eye shape. Well, she might be Japanese, but then again, her silver squash blossom earrings, uh, you might be able to recognize a Navajo Native American here. Definitely doesn't have red skin. In fact, when shiploads of Europeans first showed up off the east coast of what is now the United States of the North American continent, it was funny because the people on the ships looked at the people on the shore and said, look, red men, uh, mostly because of their suntan lotion mosquito repellent, um, had some pigment in it to also make them look attractive. Um, and the sailors on those tiny little ships that were the first ships to make it over here from Europe, they spent an awful lot of time in the blazing ocean, not a shade tree in sight for three months for the journey. Those sailors were burned to a crisp. So the Indians pointed on the ships and said, Oh my God, red men were being invaded by red men. Oh well. Um, again, if we go back and compare similar eye shape, similar round face, a little more of a broad nose, skin tone not telling us much because we really don't have that much variation in human skin tone. Um, here we've got a Southeast Asian, not a South Central Asian, like the people, um, the group of boys or the man with the nice wavy hair. But here we have an East Asian. Now this group of girls, we've got auburn, reddish brown hair, we've got black hair, we've got brown hair, and then we've got another girl in the back with more brown hair. They're all wearing matching lipstick. They're all wearing pretty much the same idea of eye makeup. They've done their eyebrows somewhat similarly. Where are they from? If you cheat and read, oh, Mohammed, they must be from the Middle East. Actually, they're Afghani. Again, we're in Asia. We don't have the dark brown skin like the Southern Indians. We don't have the straight black hair on everybody with a little bit of wave on the Northern Japanese island. We don't have the eye shape we expect for Asians, but these are native Asians. These girls are South American natives. South American natives. They look an awful lot like the East Asians I was showing you, but they're not. They're Native American, they're just Southern Native American. And they look an awful lot like these two boys, two sisters, two brothers, same facial shape, same eye shape, same nose shape, nice pointy chins, nice rounded heart-shaped cheeks. But these boys, are from Thailand. And all of a sudden I've lost my command. Exact same keys 
that have been working. Okay, there we go. Um, need to go back one. Okay, here we have straight black hair, very long straight nose, thin pointy face, medium pale skin tone, but very rosy pinkish cast to it. And I was talking about the people right on the edge between Europe and Asia, the Ural Mountain area. That's where this boy comes from. And they look alike on both sides of the mountains there. And can you guess here? Two firefighters posing with their firefighting uh, truck. And these are both Native American. Not sure if she might be mixed blood uh, because she does have light brown hair and that's not common with Native Americans. So I'm not sure, but the facial shape is classic. Um, if you know enough about Native Americans, you can tell which part of the North American continent they've come from, especially if you see a group of them together slight variation even on this one continent. And her skin tone, her facial shape looks a lot like the facial shape and skin tone here for the Native American, but her head covering might give it away. Uh, once again, we're looking at an Asian here. She's from a Muslim country. So is this woman from a Muslim country? Oh goodness, she's got the very thin face and the very straight nose uh, common to the people uh, around the Ural Mountains. She's got hazel eyes, very pale hazel eyes. And once again, she's one of those borderline folks uh, from the part of Asia that's beginning to become Europe, but it's a very gradual blend. There is no edge. Uh, and this woman, she is also from the Southern part of that boundary. She's an Armenian. And again, she's got a rosiness to her face, wavy, black hair, hazel eyes. He's an Asian, oh dear. Um, and here, I looked at this one and I thought, oh goodness, where could she be from? And I thought the hat has to be, she's a gaucho. She's a South American cowgirl, has to be. And then I looked, no, she's not South American. The caption explains that she's Chinese. So we thought we knew what Chinese people look like. Certainly most Americans would expect Chinese eyes to look like that, but the thin face, the long thin ears, ah, gosh, uh, it's just not what we're taught to think it is. Now, one of the traits that we use to distinguish race in the United States, we expect the almond-shaped eyes with a slight slant, a slight curve to be Asian. And yet almond-shaped eyes show up in different parts of the world. They're very common among Hungarians in Southern Eastern Asia. They're also very common in Finland. And so here we have Renee Zellweger, who is a um, famous actress of Finnish descent. And there she is with her natural blonde hair, her very blue eyes. But if you look at the facial shape, very, very round face. Her nose is getting a bit broad for our stereotype of the European. And um, actually, she's very Nordic. Now, if you head east into Siberia, you're going to find the exact same face shape on Siberian native people 
except they'll have black hair and brown eyes to go with that face shape. And if you continue heading east and you cross the Bering Sea and come into Eskimo territory in Alaska and Canada, you actually discover that everybody around the Arctic Circle pretty much has that same face shape. Very, very common high trait frequency and the eye shape as well. Um, scientists have figured out, they've done all kinds of tests, putting all kinds of um, uh, eye blockers on people. That narrowing of the eyes and the slight curve to the eyes, so common to everybody around the Arctic Circle, turns out you don't have to waste energy using your facial muscles to squint in the incredibly bright blinding snow when the sunlight falls on it, your face is doing that for you while your face is at rest without having to scrunch up your muscles. Now, Africa, the American stereotype is that Africans look a lot alike. And there's a reason for that in the United States that's because most of the people in the United States were brought here as slaves. And the easiest place to kidnap them from, to put them on a ship that's going to cross the Atlantic to sell them to the United States was to kidnap them from the West Coast of Africa. And the easiest way to have access to a lot of people who weren't warned ahead of time that the raiders are coming back was to get on a boat and sail down the Congo River into the heartland of Africa. So American stereotype of what an African is supposed to look like is actually the appearance of the Congolese, people from along the Congo River who lived in dense jungles with cleared farm fields. And it has a direct impact on skin tone, face shape, and everything else, the environment that they lived in along the Congo River. So most Americans will look at this person and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure she's African. Don't most Africans look like that? Now I'm gonna show you that most Africans do not look like that. Uh, here we have Africans from a different part of West Africa, and you can see that face shape has changed a lot. The nose is different, the lips are different, the cheeks are different, the coloring is even different. Well, the mother is a lot darker than the baby. She's probably been doing her best to keep the baby in the shade. Here we have another West African. Are those hazel eyes? Yes, indeed they are. And you can't see what her hair looks like. She's from a Muslim country, so her hair is covered, but she's got a very thin straight nose. She has hazel eyes, relatively thin lips, hairdo, the American stereotype of an African. She actually looks a lot like the hazel eyed, long thin nosed woman pretty much in the exact same pose that we saw earlier, who was from Afghanistan in Central Asia, but this is the west coast of Africa. Now we're in Algeria, a different part of Africa, a specific ethnic group um, who spend more time in the desert. They don't spend that much time in the shade in the jungle, so they have more of an adaptation to blazing bright sunlight. And of course, the whole skin tone <laughs> difference that we find in human beings has to do with how much sunlight our ancestors have become accustomed to being exposed to. People in Africa, especially the savannas and the deserts of Africa, need dark skin to protect themselves from the incredibly bright 
blazing sunlight protects them from sunburn a little bit. Although Africans and African-Americans do get sunburn, they don't burn as easily as somebody with pale pink, white, rosy skin from Northern Europe where not only did they have to cover their bodies to stay warm, they also had to spend most of the winter indoors in Europe, at least Northern Europe. And so we needed to get paler in order to allow enough sunlight in to get enough vitamin D so that our bones and our teeth didn't just wither away. Now here's another North African, but this is from Northeast Africa. This is the former president of Egypt and he's an African. Look what he looks like. Look at his skin tone. Africans can have very light skin. Here we have another African, very long, thin nose. We often think, well, long, thin noses must be Europeans. No, here's an African with a long, thin face, long, thin nose, south of Egypt. We have several countries south of Egypt where you have the tallest people in the world. Everything about them is long and thin. Uh, in the United States, we have a stereotype that black people play basketball really well. When the actual fact is that the hoop is up high and tall people play basketball really well. The tallest people in the world come from a strip along the east coast of Africa. And so if you go back into the ancestry of America's great African-American basketball players, you'll find that they don't come from West Africa. Their ancestors weren't kidnapped from along the Congo River. The second highest percentage of American slaves were kidnapped from the East Coast of Africa and come from those really tall people. Those are the people who are our great basketball players. They actually have, their long bones are literally longer. And so their arms are longer, their legs are longer, their hands are longer for wrapping around a basketball. Black people do not naturally play basketball better than anybody else. Tall people play basketball better. So most of the people of Africa are average height. It's only the people from along the East Coast that are tall. And one of the things that clued the scientists in that the concept of an African race was a little more than ridiculous is that the shortest people in the world also come from Africa. The pygmy people from the central African jungles. They had to adapt to forests so dense that tall people kept banging their heads. It was an adaptation to be short. You can get around in the thick undergrowth if you're very small. Pygmy people make fun of tall people because they are so clumsy in the desert, in the, in the jungles where the pygmy people come from. Interestingly enough, the pygmy people, the shortest people in the world, come from only a few hundred miles inland from the tallest people in the world. But to make the shortest people in the world and the tallest people in the world the same race just doesn't make any sense. Now, here we have a, a very unusual looking face, uh, unusual to Americans. We don't see a lot of people walking around, certainly not even in the black neighborhoods of the United States. We don't see people with faces shaped like this. The long pointy chin, the um, lower part of the face around the mouth literally thrust out from the face, the chin 
not protruding, but the chin going straight down from the mouth, very broad nose, but notice it's narrow at the top and those incredibly high cheekbones and very round eyes. You're not gonna find an epicanthic fold here. So human beings evolved in Africa and scientists the, to the best of our ability to figure it out, we believe that the people of the Kalahari Desert and surrounding deserts uh, in Southern Africa have lived in a similar environment for hundreds of thousands of years. Everybody else has moved to different environments and had to adapt to their new environment, like people uh, having eyes become permanently squinted so that they can deal with sunlight on snow or people having to adapt to being indoors most of the year and wearing a lot of clothing when they do go outdoors, needing to get really, really pale to let the sunlight in to get vitamin D. These are the people who have stayed put. So they haven't had to evolve to look different. They haven't had to evolve a new body shape or a new facial shape. So this is what everybody, everybody I'm talking to, everybody on the planet, every human being, if we go back far enough, this is what our ancestors look like. People of the Kalahari. Now I cannot strongly enough recommend these two books. Everyone is African, talks about humankind evolving in Africa and leaving Africa in different waves of immigration, winding up in different places. And the seven daughters of Eve, I'm gonna continue a little longer and get into the concept of the seven daughters of Eve, um, science that reveals our genetic ancestry as we continue to explore the human genome. So human variation. Yeah, there's human variation. Believe it or not, we share more than 98% of our genes with chimpanzees. Nine, more than 98%. Change a little more than 1% of our genes and you get a chimp. That's how similar human DNA, we don't have much variation in human DNA. We have a very narrow species, unless you want to include chimpanzees and then we can finally get to almost 2% variation. Human beings have very little genetic variation. And so when the scientists who are trying to figure out how many races there are said, well, we certainly can't figure it out by looking at face shapes and hair color. Uh, let's, let's be super scientists and look at DNA. Let's get down to the molecular level and see what we can conclude. The DNA patterns that we find in the human species have no resemblance whatsoever ever to anybody's categories of race. Not the United States, black, white, red, and yellow. Not the Japanese version of race where the Koreans are a separate race. And the lower classes of Japan are a separate race from the mainstream Japanese. Not the Brazilian version, which is really based on skin color. And if you get a suntan, your race has just changed. Um, no, when they looked at DNA, they did find variation. They found a very consistent pattern of variation depending on what features of DNA they were looking for. And so we're gonna talk mitochondrial DNA. That's what the seven daughters of Eve goes into. Mitochondrial DNA is found in every cell and unlike all the rest of our DNA, half of which comes from mom and half of which comes from dad, mitochondrial DNA only comes from your mother. 
using mitochondrial DNA, we can trace everybody, man or woman, we can trace their maternal line back through the ages. It's been highly stable. There aren't very many mutations of it. And if we're gonna look for a way to divide people into human groups, the seven daughters of Eve says, let's try looking at the seven significant variants of mitochondrial DNA. And then there are submutations of those seven that result in 32, they refuse to call them races, but the scientists are beginning to call them clans. And I'm gonna show you what the human family tree looks like based on our mitochondrial DNA. And here it is. Well, gosh, first of all, it doesn't look like a family tree. It kind of looks like a family vine. There's my cursor. Okay, we start here all descended from an African ancestor. And these are the different branches. Now the ones that I've colored in in red are only, whoops, are only found in Africa. Oh no. Uh, okay. It spit me out. We can see. Have to be careful where I move that cursor. Okay. The um, kind of diamond shaped, the box on its side, there aren't too many of those. And they are only found in East Eurasia. So they're the East Asians and the Native Americans, these groups here. Then East Eurasia, we have some groups that are only found in East Asia and nowhere else. Then Central and West Eurasia, that's to say Europe and the area around the Ural Mountains. And here are these groups over here. And there's two main clusters. And then We have one total shock. Uh, the going theory was that all Native Americans are descended directly and only from people who walked here from Siberia during the Ice Age when there was a land bridge. However, we have found one cluster of people who share genes, mitochondrial DNA, and therefore share a female ancestor shared in common between West Eurasia, parts of Scotland uh, and so on, on the west coast of Asia, north and south west coast, and Native America. Whoa. So this is what the human family tree looks like based on mitochondrial DNA. And there's no black, white, red, yellow. There's no um, Africa, Europe, Asia, Native America. It's not there. Uh, science is showing that everything we expected to find based on our culture's ideas of race, science can show that there is just no such thing. And yet life and death of billions of people for centuries now has depended on what race your society puts you in. Because we invented race to work that way. Race was not imposed upon us by nature or by God. We made it all up. And that's what I'm going to be talking about next time. So does anybody have a question? I'm going to get rid of the pictures. 
and come back over here. So Linda, is Ancestry, is Ancestry using these kind of DNA um, schemes and also, what is it, um, 23andMe? Yeah, it's, it's funny about them. They are based in our culture. So when they get their scientific data that tells you something very specific, they kind of lose the data and translate it into our concepts of race. So say that you send in your sample and they um, send back a report, your sample will give you usually data that can pinpoint a location, like a bank of a specific river in a specific mountain range in a certain part of the world. There is no such thing as an African set of genes. And so instead, for example, most African Americans, when they send it in, they'll get information that tells them most of them are going to be from points along the Congo River. But it's actually gonna be more specific than just the Congo River. It's gonna give you a certain range of miles and usually which side of the river you came from. And then 23andMe and Ancestry will take that very detailed information and they'll turn it into the bigger picture that we're expecting and it will tell you African. Whereas what you really get is much more specific. Very good question. Who else? Okay. I, I will also entertain arguments if anybody wants to have a say. Anybody? I hope I got you thinking. Uh, Lynn, give us a preview of next week and maybe that'll stimulate. Okay. Okay, next week, um, if there's no such thing as black, white, red, and yellow, um, and if all Africans don't look anything like people from along the Congo River, and if Europeans really do have every possible hair color in the world, and why should we make that one race? Um, it's because of our history. It's because you have conquerors coming from overseas, arriving on this continent, and it has a lot to do with the history, um, the desperation of the people. I mean, Europe was hell. Europe was waves of disease. Europe was waves of famine. Europe was chronic warfare. The people who came over here, we gloss it over and say that they came for opportunity. They came to get out of hell. They came for a chance at surviving uh, longer than about the 35 year life expectancy that Europe had at the time. And they had to come over here. They could have made friends with the Indians. They could have intermarried. They could have adapted their culture to the Indians culture, but they chose not to. And they arrived to steal as much of a continent they could get. And they all arrived with religion, with a very clear code of behavior that included thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's stuff. It included thou shalt not steal. And it included thou shalt not kill. So coming over here with those rules, but looking around and coveting everything they saw and wanting to get one another to join in taking everything they saw, 
they needed a way to still believe themselves to be good Christians who weren't stealing and weren't coveting and weren't killing. And if they could make the people they were killing and stealing from not really people that made it conceptually and morally okay. And so the concept of race, Europe did a little bit to think of race, you know, they were sending out all the explorers and trading for spices and bringing back Chinese silks and well, Chinese China, that's where the word comes from. Um, they had marvelous dishes over there and everybody wanted some, but they didn't create ideas of race based on interactions with China. They really created concepts of race to dehumanize the Native American people they were stealing from and the African people that they brought over to do all the work on all the land they had taken. And in order to justify that inhumanity and say, we're not doing this to human beings, America created the global, we spread it from here, created our global concepts of race in order to say, yeah, they're not quite human. And so we're gonna explore how that happened and we're gonna compare our system. Brazil was also immigrants. Brazil was also Europeans conquering native land and taking it all away from them. Brazil also okay. brought over a bunch of African slaves. And yet the Brazilian system is different because of one little difference in their immigration pattern compared to ours. And we can really see how we created our system essentially to justify racism rather than to be scientific. Um, and we can really see exactly why we created what we did because of that one little difference with Brazil that led them to come up with a similar and yet so different system that nobody in Brazil thinks America has ever had a black president because the racial system says Barack Obama is definitely not a black man. And we'll get into that next time. We'll start bringing it up to the present and leave our ancient ancestors behind. Cheryl, you're talking and we can't hear you. Last opportunity for a question, if anybody has one. I love questions. Please, questions. Yes. Chuck, you need to unmute. Yeah. Actually, it's not a question. I just want to say how marvelous this uh, presentation has been. It's just fascinating. So thank you very, it's, very much. It's mind boggling when you when it you. Is. When they first started showing me pictures of Australian Aborigines with their natural red hair and blonde hair, and then showed epicanthic folds in Europe, the, the Asian eyes, and then said it was common among Hungarians. And then um, I looked at an old photo of my own grandmother, a Transylvanian Saxon so proud of our German heritage. And yet her first name was Theresia, and Theresia is not the German version of Teresa. Theresia is the Hungarian version. And you look at my grandmother and she's got the epicanthic fold. She, I've got a picture of her where she looks Japanese. <laughs> and I started learning this and looking at my own family and going, oh my God, and some of the Western branch, I have set some second cousins who have epicanthic folds, slightly less than my grandmother did, but it was extreme in my grandmother. And I have pictures of her, her mother, and she really had it too. At least more than Renee Zellweger did. <laughs> All right. Well We'll see everybody hopefully next week and bring some others to join. Bring your friends. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you everybody.